In this video, I'm going to walk you through my full process for creating this honeybee animation using Blender. Whilst I touched upon parts of the production in my last video, that focused far more upon the lessons which I've learned over the past 25 years that I've been creating animation. Since I love learning about how others work, I thought it would be helpful to share a more detailed breakdown of how I brought this character to life. Since I mentioned it a lot in my last video, I'll keep this brief. Reference is essential, even with stylized work. During this project, I made use of it both to understand the anatomy of honeybees, and also to gain a better idea of how they move. Based upon my reference, I first developed the design of the honeybee, and then also created this illustration, which would serve as inspiration for the environment, as well as the final lighting of the animation. I know I'll refine things further once I move into 3D, but starting with an illustration like this gives me a clear direction to head in, and reduces the time which might otherwise be wasted by experimenting in 3D. Once I was happy with the design, I started to rough out the basic proportions within Blender. I tried to keep things simple for as long as possible, since this makes changes far easier to implement. With the main proportions working, I added some eyeballs and began to sculpt the head. Once again, I tried to keep things simple for as long as possible, only increasing the detail as required. This makes it far easier to achieve a smooth end result. As always though, there's an ugly phase which needs to be worked through, as I refine the sculpt and search for appealing forms. Once I was happy, I moved on to the thorax, where I made use of the sculpting tools to refine the base geometry. In this case, there was no need to remesh the geometry, which meant that I avoided having to retopologize it later. For the abdomen, I could simply make use of the standard modeling tools to add the details that I needed. Since insects have distinctly segmented bodies, I was able to keep the various body parts separate and experiment with posing the character early on. To do this, I simply parented the individual body parts to each other and then rotated them into a pose. I set keyframes on the geometry in both its neutral and its pose states, which allowed me to make adjustments in the neutral state and then rapidly see how they would work within a pose. Also, by using linked duplicates of the legs, I was able to edit just one leg and see the changes reflected on all of the others. To save some time, I repurposed part of the leg to use as the basis of the antenna. Once again, this was modeled straight, but I then animated it into a pose state to see how it would work. Since all of the main forms were now looking good, I returned to the head to sculpt the eyelids. I'll often jump around like this between different body parts as I'm modeling a character, so that I can gradually increase the level of detail across the entire model. This helps to ensure that everything looks cohesive and that I don't make the mistake of over-detailing any particular area. Next, I made use of masks to define the area of the mouth and sculpted it into an open state. After a little bit of final polishing, the head sculpt was complete and I finalized the model by adding a simple tongue. Whilst I used the sculpting tools across the model, this was often simply to push and pull the underlying geometry, which already had good topology. As a result, it was only the head of the character that required any retopology. For this, as always, I started by defining the areas around the eyes and the mouth. Having good edge flow here is really important when it comes to deforming the geometry smoothly in animation. Whilst I'm working, I mark some edges as seams. This turns the edges red, and I can then use that as a visual indicator to ensure that I'm creating edge loops in the right place to aid deformation. Once I'm finished with the retopology, I'll clear these seams so that they don't interfere when creating UVs for the head later. The rest of the retopology is straightforward, and largely a case of joining the islands together and creating a smooth flow around the back of the head. The final modeling task is to refine the shape of the wings and add some more geometry to define the leading edge. Since I already knew how I wanted to animate the honeybee, I decided to use an FK setup for the legs, rather than adding the complexity of inverse kinematics. If I were creating a rig to be used by multiple animators or in a range of different scenarios, IK would have been essential, but in this case, I opted to keep the rigging fast and simple. Since the bee is flying, having a master control which pivots in the center of the bee's thorax was essential. This allows the main flight motion to be easily controlled and feel believable. Something that I did spend a bit longer setting up was a system of constraints to enable me to isolate the rotation of the head, abdomen and legs to either follow the thorax or the main flight control. This really helps to create more fluid and natural motion, since by setting the rotation of these parts to only be affected by the flight control, 
I can animate the rotation of the thorax without then having to counter animate the other body parts back into place. Again, with a rig to be used by other animators, I would add custom properties to make this space switching easy to access. But for my own purposes, I could simply toggle this using the constraints in the property panel. For the hair of the bee, I experimented with both hair particles and the newer geometry nodes based system. Whilst the hair particles have the advantage of offering simulation, the geometry nodes use a number of presets which help to achieve a good look more rapidly. In the end, I opted to use geometry nodes for this character, since I was after a short, fuzzy look and felt that I could get away without using simulation. It still took a little trial and error to get the exact look that I was after, but overall I'm happy with the final result. Once the rig was complete, I defined seams on the various parts of the body and unwrapped the UVs. Since most of the final look of the character was achieved with the shaders, the texture painting for this character was very simple, and I just really painted the eyelashes, the interior of the mouth, and then added stripes to the abdomen. Subsurface scattering is something which I used extensively to simulate the way in which light can often be seen passing through a bee's exoskeleton. Obviously, a certain amount of artistic license was required here, and I simply dialed in the settings to get a look that I was happy with. I then also made use of procedural noise to break up the reflections and add some subtle bump to the head and legs, which I feel helps create a softer look. The hair was the most complex element to shade well, and a certain amount of trial and error was required here. Using the intercept parameter from the Curves Info node, I was able to add a gradient along the length of each hair strand. This was multiplied on top of another gradient, which added a degree of randomness to each hair strand, again, courtesy of the Curve Info node. Finally, these two gradients were multiplied over a modified version of the base abdomen texture. The daisy was both simple and fun to model, and made extensive use of the array modifier. This allowed me to model a single petal, and then use an empty object in the array modifier's object offset to rotate the additional petals by a fixed amount. Since all of the resulting petals were still linked to the original, I could continue to modify the petal and see the changes propagate around the rest of the flower. The same technique was used for the underside of the flower head, making use of the original petal again as a starting point. For the stalk, I made use of curves, with one curve defining the stalk itself, and a second curve being used as a bevel object. Modeling in this way is not only fast, but it also keeps the stalk easily editable. The shaders for the daisy again made use of procedural noise to add surface detail, alongside subsurface scattering and some transmission. The petals also made use of transmission to allow the light to pass through them convincingly. Whilst I was shading these elements, it was important to make use of lighting which would be similar to the final look, to ensure that the transmission and subsurface settings could be dialed in correctly. With the daisy complete, I set my camera position and started to lay out the rest of the shot. I duplicated additional daisies to use in the background, and then sculpted their petals to introduce some randomness. The background is simply a plane, with a noise texture fed through a colour ramp into an emission shader. Obviously, when laying out the scene, I decided to vary the composition slightly from the original illustration. I chose to face the large daisy in the foreground away from the camera, since this would allow the bee to approach it while still looking towards the camera. I also placed the flowers in the background in a way which would maximise the sense of depth within the shot. Once I was happy with the general composition of the scene using the daisies, I added some additional flowers and grass blades to add some variety and pops of colour. Before starting the animation, I first linked my honeybee rig into the scene file with the environment. I always make use of linked rigs, as it gives me maximum flexibility to return to the original model or rig and have any changes propagate through all of my animation files. For maximum speed when animating, I keep my viewport set to solid mode, and I disabled all of the hair curves in the viewports, since these had a significant impact on playback performance. For the animation, my first priority was to define the main path taken by the honeybee, along with some rough timing. I wasn't worried about poses at this stage, and simply worked with the main flight control. I tried to ensure that the bee was rising and falling along a flight path which was both interesting, but also believably motivated. I was also careful to vary the timing of the bee as it moved from flower to flower. This helps the animation to look less robotic, as well as creating a nice feeling of contrast between the slower and faster movements. Again, this still had to feel motivated, but I was able to pause and build anticipation and energy for the faster moves, which showed the bee's excitement. I was now able to move into posing the character, and this is one of the areas where reference helped to show how a bee holds its legs when in flight. Obviously, 
I then used a heavy dose of exaggeration and caricature when it came to the other poses, but having elements which are pulled from reality helps add to the overall believability. When it came to posing the bee landing in the daisy close to the camera, this is where I would typically rely upon IK legs to keep the feet in place, but since the legs were not visible to camera, I could simply pose them in a way which looked convincing, and provided that the movement of the body was also believable, no one would know the difference. Something which added to the overall believability of the shot was adding a subtle movement to the vegetation, and then also having the flowers which were closest to the bee react as if blown about by its wings. This is once again an exaggeration of what happens in reality, but it makes the elements of the scene feel connected, and if kept subtle, doesn't distract the viewer's eye from the main action. When animating, I try to avoid getting bogged down in the graph editor. Typically, I'll use constant tangents to keep everything stepped and simply flip between the poses I've created myself for as long as possible. There comes a time though when F-curves need to be set to Bezier to refine the in-betweens. Even here, where possible, I'll add additional keyframes to better define an arc or improve the spacing, rather than relying upon the curves to do this for me. I try to limit curve editing to smoothing out certain elements and polishing the final result. For the flapping wings, I created a simple cycle, which I added to the nonlinear animation editor. I then animated the influence of the NLA strip in order to turn the flapping on and off when required. This enabled me to take the keyframes which controlled the wings, which obviously needed to be keyed on every frame, and isolate that from the rest of the animation. This was really done just to simplify the process of adjusting the body animation separately to that of the wings. The blurred effect for the flapping wings was achieved by enabling motion blur in the render settings, and experimenting with the speed and range of motion of the wings until I achieved a result that I was happy with. Something which is important to note here is that the quality of motion blur was far better when parenting the wing geometry directly to the bones rather than deforming them via the armature. This is a result of a current limitation with the motion blur of deformations within Blender. For the lighting, I used an HDRI image set to a low strength to provide a general ambient lighting before adding multiple small area lights throughout the scene. These were placed to illuminate the key focal points of the shot and give the impression of dappled light which the bee could fly in and out of. This effect was further enhanced through the addition of the light beams in the background. The light beams are generated using a noise texture and a couple of gradient textures which control the placement of that noise. By switching the noise texture to 4D, we can then animate the W value to create the effect of light beams passing through leaves. In addition to creating visual interest, the dappled light also helps me to direct the audience's attention to whatever I want them to focus on. As the bee first enters the shot, it's very small and could be easily missed. By keeping it in silhouette and placing it in front of a beam of light, a high degree of contrast is created to draw the eye. The opposite effect is used later on within the shot, as the bee is brightly illuminated against the darker background. In order to further enhance the believability of the shot, I added some animation and a focus pull on the camera. This helps to create the impression that the scene is being filmed with the camera following the action, both with its placement and with the focus following the main subject. In addition, the shallow depth of field combined with the focus pull works in tandem with the lighting to direct the audience's eye to the focus of the shot, the honeybee. The final stage of the production was to add some simple compositing. Two simple masks were created and used in conjunction with color balance nodes to help boost the contrast in the center of the image, whilst also darkening and desaturating the edges and bottom right of the image. This makes the result look far more visually interesting, whilst further focusing the audience's attention to the main area of action. I hope that you enjoyed this breakdown of my process, and maybe learned something new that you can try in your own work. If you'd like to learn more about how I make projects like this one, I have a range of animation-related articles and courses on the Into Animation website, as well as a weekly newsletter. This project was a lot of fun to create, and I hope, if nothing else, it inspires you to go and create something exciting and original of your own. <laughs>